praise the Lord God of hosts. Amen. I'm going to ask you this morning to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Mark. The book of Mark. As we continue our series through Mark, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. We're going to pick up, pick up right where we left off. Verse by verse, word for word. It's been, I've already just had such an amazing, amazing time going through uh, this, this precious, precious gospel. The, the shortest of the gospels, yet still packed, packed with biblical truth. And, uh, and we could say that the fast-paced gospel, immediately, immediately we're going to see that word appear over and over, yet still uh, just so many things that, that Mark chronicles here concerning Jesus' life and his ministry, his teaching, and ultimately it culminates in his cross work and what he did at the cross and in his most blessed resurrection. We're going to look at Mark chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 9 through 13. So I'll read them now. So he writes in verse 9, he says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice out of the heavens, excuse me, and a voice came out of the heavens. You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. And verse 12, Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. Let us pray. Father, now, as I preach your word, I do pray for much grace, that you would enable me to, to make known the truth of Scripture, to make known the, the, the truth of this text, this passage, and ultimately to exalt Christ. And Father, I pray for the hearers to be blessed as they hear the word of God preach. And for the unconverted souls who hear this, that they would be saved from their sins. And as we saw this morning, you working all things uh, in our Sunday school lesson, how you're working all things for your glory. And to bring your name, Lord, we just ask now that you would be glorified in our worship, as we continue to worship you through hearing the word preached. We ask all these things in the name of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 The title of this sermon is, Jesus' Ministry Begins. Begins. Oftentimes when we think of the ministry of our blessed Lord, our minds do not immediately go to the beginning of it. Oftentimes, we begin to think about its culmination, the end of it, that being his cross work, or even his resurrection and his post-resurrection ministry. Or perhaps our minds go to think about some of the various things he taught. Or perhaps thinking about the miracles which he performed. Or perhaps we will think about how he was criticized by even some who claimed to be his followers. <laughs> But I would say very rarely, at least for myself and people that I tend to be around, we do not often reference the beginning of our Lord's ministry. And it, was, it started with, you could say, started with a bang in the sense that there, it was a spectacular event that took place. And really there was a couple of spectacular events that took place to mark the beginning of Christ's ministry. For we know from the scriptural record, that most of Jesus' life was not recorded for us. But he lived a quiet life as a carpenter until he was about 30 years of age. And that is when his ministry began. And it lasted about three years and culminated ultimately in his cross work, as I just referenced earlier, his resurrection, and then ultimately his ascension into glory. Now it is for a divine reason that those 30 years of Silence are just that, 30 years of silence. There is a divine reason, and it is in the mind of God. We may not know necessarily why God has kept from us some of the things which happened in Jesus' life before then. But we do know this, that he was not publicly ministering, not publicly ministering during that time. And so to, to mark such a dramatic transition from going and living as such a quiet and humble life, there is a great, I would say, a few different events that mark this magnificent transition. To
to Christ openly revealing who he is through his miracles, through his teaching, and ultimately through his atonement at the cross. And so just a couple of those events is what we're going to consider this morning in this text of Scripture. Two of those events specifically by name. Firstly, his baptism, marking the beginning of his ministry. And then secondly, we're going to consider his fasting, or specifically his temptation that took place in the wilderness. But before we do, I'd like for us to consider briefly the context of this verse, as we always do in scriptural interpretation. And we, if you remember from last week, we just considered in verses 2 through 8 the ministry of John the Baptist. So we're continuing on with very similar subject pattern, uh, subject matter, I should say. In that, we just looked at John's ministry, now we're looking at Jesus' ministry. There's a transference of attention that takes place in the Gospel writer's mind here. And of course we know, because he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, this was Holy Spirit wrought. This is something that the Spirit of God desired to be written. That the focus was taken off of John and put on our blessed Lord. You could say that Jesus came along and took the baton that John had labored over to erect and to build. Jesus came and stepped upon ground that, Mar that uh, John the Baptist had labored upon, preparing the people's hearts for the coming of the Lord. In fact, that is exactly what it says in verse 2 of this chapter. It says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of Yahweh. Make his path straight. And so that was the purpose of John's ministry. And then in the ensuing verses we saw, we, we considered some various aspects of John, who he was, and then of some of the things that he taught. And we also spoke on, in verse 7 specifically, we looked at how he exalted Christ, how he carried about within himself a great humility. A great, a tremendous humility, thinking himself not even worthy to untie Jesus' sandals. The most menial task of a slave. And so that really brings to, clo to close John's ministry, preparing people's hearts for the coming of the Messiah. And so we find ourselves in a transitional verse in verse 9. And in fact, your Bible may mark it as the beginning of a new paragraph. Rightly so, because the thought has now changed from going from John to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as I said, we're going to see two things in these verses. Firstly, we're going to see that Jesus' ministry, the beginning of it, was marked by baptism, and that's verses 9 through 11. And secondly, we're going to see that it was marked by his temptation, his fasting in the wilderness, and that's verses 12 and 13. So let us look at these verses now. It begins in verse 9. He writes, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth. Again, as I said, humble background, humble beginning. In fact, the Nazareth was not spoken of at all in the Old Testament. It was a very small village, you could say. And Jesus, as we know, was simply a carpenter, someone who did not make much money, but wealthy didn't have great stature. In fact, as we're going to see later on when we go over to Luke 4, that really the, the people that Jesus grew up around were offended, and they took offense that he was saying he was the Son of God and he was the Messiah, because they said there's no way. There's no way. Someone is humble. So, a nobody coming along and saying he's Messiah. And that shows really that the utter spiritual blindness that they possess, because they could not discern that God was walking among them. And so it says, in those days, that being, of course, Jesus coming around the age of 30, comes from Nazareth, in Galilee. And it says, he was baptized by John in the Jordan. He was baptized. Now the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ is of great significance. Of great significance. It is not that Lord Jesus needed to be baptized in the sense that he needed to repent, because we know what? John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. That's what it says in verse 4. It says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Christ didn't need a baptism for the repentance or for the remission of sins. 
So what was the divine purpose behind this great act? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ need, why did he see fit to be baptized by John? In fact, we're going to see in a moment that John even took offense. He was offended. Really shocked, a better word would be shocked. He was astounded that the Son of God would want to be baptized by him. Let's go over there. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3, if you turn with me. Because Matthew writes more detail on this specific event than Mark does, and really fills in the gaps and gives us a greater understanding of, of what exactly happened there when Jesus was baptized. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, it says these words. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee. That's just what Mark said as well. At the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. Now listen to what verse 14 says. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. In effect, he's saying, Lord, I need you to baptize me. I need to be cleansed. I'm a sinner. And you're perfect. We know from uh, the Gospel of John that when John saw Christ, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so really there's this confusion that is upon John. And so he asks, You come to me? And in verse 15, we see really a divine mystery that is revealed to us here in verse 15. It says, But Jesus answering said to him, permitted at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. This is a great mystery indeed. And Scripture does not have too much to say about this specific point. In fact, that's the only, where, in the only place in the entire Bible where it speaks of Christ's baptism in that manner. That he was fulfilling all righteousness. See, brethren, what we must realize about Christ our Lord is in his perfect life, he had to do something. He had to do something. Th those 30 years weren't for nothing. And even those years of his ministry, that was for a specific purpose, and it was to fulfill all righteousness. Fulfill all righteousness. He goes on in two chapters later in Matthew 5 17, he says, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. See, God's law, what have we done to God's law? We have broken God's law, and that is why sinners go to hell for their sin, because they transgressed, they've rebelled against God's law. They've broken His commands. But, what does Scripture say? If you keep God's law, you'll be blessed. That's all throughout the Old Testament, especially in Deuteronomy. Basically, that's the message of Deuteronomy. Keep the law, you'll be blessed. Don't keep it, you'll be cursed. Blessing and a curse. Over and over and over again, it's laid before the Israelites in the Old Testament. And what do we find in Old Testament history? Time and time again, do the Israelites transgress God's law. They break the covenant of works. And thereby bring upon themselves curses. Ultimately, they were sent into exile for their sin. They were given wicked rulers as punishment for their iniquity. They were not given relief by all the nations that surrounded them. They had to go to war constantly because of their sin. All they had to do was keep the law of God. But see, man in his sinful state cannot keep the law of God. In fact, we know from Romans chapter 1, the man who is dead in sin is hostile to God and he is a hater of God. And so in order for the man to be reconciled with his creator, two things must happen, in effect. Two things must come about. And what are they? Well, firstly, his transgressions must be forgiven. He must be forgiven of his law breaking. But something else has to happen. That would be the negative side of things. Because the negative is he's broken the law. But here's a positive. He has to keep it. He's got to fulfill the law. Can we do that? Can we keep the law of God? No. We cannot keep God's law. We cannot live in perfect conformity to the commands. Think about it. 
But Jesus said in his ministry, the two most important commands that God gave, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. Can any of us say for even the slightest moment in our life that we have kept those commands? No. No. In fact, I ask people a lot of times when I'm on the streets and evangelizing, sometimes I'll run across someone who is rank in pride. Rank. It's, 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 it's disgusting how pride, prideful people are. And uh, one of the things I'll tell me is, yeah, I'm good. I'm good enough to make it to heaven. And I'll say, have you kept God's law? They'll say, absolutely, I've kept God's law. I said, well, okay, now according to those two commands that I just, I just quoted to you, I say, have you for even a second, five seconds, 30 seconds in your entire life lived in perfect conformity to these two commands? Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Everything about your being is in, is in full worship to God and, and full obedience to God. Rarely have I had someone actually uh, be so deluded that they would say, yes, yes, they've done it. Typically, people say, no, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. We haven't. We haven't even gotten close. Even as Christians, think about this, brethren. Even as Christians, we haven't even approach this. We haven't even get in this realm of this perfect conformity to the character and law of God. Or, or even the second command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, people talk about you need to love yourself before you love others. No, you don't. You need to hate yourself. You need to abhor yourself. We need to be self-loathing. In fact, I say that I, I, I picked up this phrase a couple weeks ago. I've been saying it all the time to people. Jesus is not a self-love guru. He's a self-hate guru. You fall after Christ because you hate yourself. You're abhor, you abhor yourself. The, the, the more we loathe ourselves, the better we are in our holiness in our prayer lives, in our walk with God, because we're not looking at ourselves, we're not taking pride in ourselves. That's why a lot of these uh, false teachers, uh, prosperity gospel preachers talk about, you know, you just need to learn to love yourself. No, you don't. Do not be a lover of yourself. Forget about yourself. That's what Scripture talks about. It says forget about yourself. Forget about your desires. Forget about your dreams. Forget about your wants. And fall after Christ and live for the glory of Christ. Brethren, that's what we're called to do. But we don't even approach that. And even it calls us to love our neighbor, to lay our lives down in service of those who are around us, but we don't even approach that. And so we stand before the, the, the law of God as transgressors and as lawbreakers. Not even close to fulfilling it. And therefore we have a vast distance between ourselves and God. And so Christ comes, and many Christians know this. He died on the cross. He paid for our sin. But do we realize the, the meaning of His life? Do we realize the meaning of His obedience? Do we realize the meaning of His baptism? That in that, He fulfilled all righteousness for us. This is a divine mystery. Jesus repented for us. Repented on our, our behalf. What I mean by that is he didn't need to do it. He didn't need to undergo this baptism. But he did it in our place. Because even our repentance is vile in the sight of God. Think about that, brother. Even our repentance is not perfect. In fact, the Puritans used to say, even our tears of repentance need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. That is so true. Even our, even our brokenness needs to be cleansed by Christ. Because it's filthy. It's filthy. What does Isaiah 64.6 uh, say? Uh, all, all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And so Jesus comes in. He prays perfectly. He loves perfectly. He's baptized perfectly. He, is, uh, he, um, he, he does everything perfectly. He honors his father and his mother perfectly. He never lies. He never steals. He never lusts. He is perfect. He is the epitome of perfection, of moral perfection. And so he fulfills the law of God. And so we don't realize, we think, oh, well, he just pays our penalty, we're good to go. No, it must be fulfilled. The law must be fulfilled. There's a negative side to justification and there's a positive <coughs> side to justification. Oftentimes we neglect the positive aspect of justification before God. And so that is why in Matthew 3 he says... We must fulfill all righteousness. And so when we begin to contemplate, why did Jesus live this life? Why didn't He just come, why didn't he just come down from heaven? Uh, just 
create a body, just become a man, that he would still become a man, live really short, die, and, then, and just finish the work of salvation for us. Because he had to fulfill all righteousness. He had to. He had to keep God's law on our behalf. Ultimately, why is that? How does that play into us? Okay, so we know Jesus died for us. He paid for our law breaking. But how does his law keeping affect me? How does Christ's active obedience affect me? How? Well, when the believer repents and believes upon Christ, God credits to them the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That, that, that's what the, the reformers called imputed righteousness. Impute means simply to credit to, to account over. It, it's, a, it's a term that's used in a lot of times in a financial situation. You're accounting something to someone else. You're crediting something to someone else. And so we're credited with having lived Jesus' life. That, that God sees the believer as if he or she had performed as Jesus had performed. God sees us, brethren, as if we performed as if Jesus performed, and just as Jesus did perform. God sees us having lived his life. Why? Because he looked at Christ on the cross, and he saw Christ having lived our life. You see, that's the exchange of the gospel. He takes my sin, he takes my filth, and I receive his righteousness as a gift of grace, I'm wrapped in the garment, the seamless garment of His righteousness. That's the glory of the gospel, friends. And um, my dad actually referenced this verse last night. We were talking at dinner. So thank you, Dad. Sermon prep uh, happened over there. No, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, this verse is just an amazing, amazing text. Uh, Philippians 3, Paul's testimony, Paul's personal salvation testimony. And listen to the way Paul explains his own salvation. And this comes right out of what we just, we just considered. He says, uh, verse 8, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, Listen to this, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. God gives the sinner righteousness. Perfect, imputed righteousness. God credits the sinner with having lived Christ's life. And this is very significant. In the beginning of Jesus' ministry, this marks the beginning of His public ministry. This, this mark of fulfilling all righteousness, His public display that He's coming to fulfill the law on behalf of the people of God so that when in our own lives here 2,000 years ago, when the Spirit of God brings us to saving faith in Christ, not only are we forgiven of our law breaking, but we are regarded as if we were law keeping. That's why I stress, every time I preach the gospel, I, ne I, I just never forget that because I don't want to forget that. That's so precious. And it's so often neglected when people preach the gospel. They oftentimes just preach that one aspect of it. Christ's atoning work of the cross, and now that, for that we have forgiveness of sin, that's great. We ought to preach that. But do we ever hear the positive aspect that, that right, the righteousness of Jesus is given to me? And so God sees me clothed in Him. That's why, why do you think the Bible uses the terminology over and over? In Him, in Christ, in Him. It's just over and over and over. In Jesus, we are found in Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Where is it found? It's in Him. We are wrapped in Him. It's not that we're actually, when we're saved, we're transported into heaven, we're put in Jesus. We're here on earth. But what God, it's God's regarding us as if we're in Christ. And so this baptism of our Lord Jesus has great significance. Great significance. He repented on our behalf. That's just so glorious. So we think about, man, I just, I, my belief is not strong enough. My repentance is not good enough. That's okay, Christ repented for you. Christ believed, Christ had perfect faith in the Father for us. That's why even the weakest faith, the, even the most doubtful faith, if it's pointed at the Savior, will save. And the strongest of faith, if it is not pointed at the Savior, will damn. Whoever, it doesn't matter how strong your faith is, it's where your faith is pointed. Is your faith in the Savior 
If it is, then it doesn't matter how strong or weak it is, it saves. And so that really, and I could go on, that is really a sermon in and of itself, the baptism of Christ and its significance. But I want us to go back to Mark chapter 1, verse 9 there. So we have consider that he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And we've already, even uh, last week, we, uh, we considered the importance of even the Jordan River and the significance of, of John ministering there. So we won't go into that now. But verse 10, we find the first occurrence of this very most important word, uh, one of the most important, that is used here, Mark, immediately. Immediately. And well, Mark just loves this word. It's used ten times in chapter 1. Ten times. There's only 45 verses. Chapter 1. That's not a huge chapter. And he uses it ten times. Uh, this is, that's why I said this is kind of the fast-paced gospel. That's what John MacArthur in his, uh, in his uh, study Bible, he calls it the fast-paced gospel. And I like that because that's really how, how Mark writes. It's just, it just goes from event to event to event. It's just very quick. And he uses this phrase immediately as a transitional phrase. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And so Christ, as he's baptized for us, he comes up and something happens. Heaven is open. In fact, I, I like what the ESV says. I typically don't, don't reference the ESV because I, I, I just think it's weak in some way, in some areas of translation. But it, it doesn't very uh, dramatic. It translates the text very dramatically here. Uh, the ESV renders verse 10 is this. It says, And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. That's some strong language. Heaven is open. And then this is so significant. Who is coming out of heaven? It is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. God is coming down out of heaven, heaven and he, he descends and says, like a dove upon him. It comes upon Christ. And this speaks to the messianic anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was Mashiach in the Hebrew. He was the Christ, or that would be the Greek word there. And it simply means anointed one. And really to understand this, we need to go back in time. We need, to, we need to transport ourselves back into ancient Israel, into some of the earliest days of Israel's monarch. And you don't have to go there, but I'm going to go over to 1 Samuel 16. And this is the anointing of David as king. It says in verse 1, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse... The Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. And then the ensuing verses, he goes to, to Jesse, his sons are brought before him, and basically, in effect, here's what happens. The Lord tells him no for every one of them. No, 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 this is not it. He is not the one. And then in verse 11, it says, And Samuel saw, said to Jesse, Are these all your children? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And so here, really, we have uh, Jesse didn't even think it a good idea to bring David over. Probably because of his youthfulness. He just, there's no way he could be a king, is what Jesse was perhaps thinking. But listen to what it says in verse 12. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of Yahweh came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and went to Ramah. This is significant. So in ancient Israel, in order to set apart, what they would do is when they would set apart a king, is they would take oil. In fact, I read online um, that it's, it was actually olive oil, scented olive oil. And they would pour it onto him, and that symbolized that God's blessing presided upon the king. That God had set that man apart to rule his people. And then listen to what it says, though, in verse 13. It's the Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. 
very, very, very significant is this correlation between the anointing and the Holy Spirit. Because ultimately we know what? From the New Testament, the Spirit is the anointing from God. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. We have an anointing from God. God has set us apart. He has anointed us by His Spirit. But it says here in the Old, and this would be the Old Covenant, that David had the Holy Spirit upon him, enabling him to be king over Israel. And what do we know? Ultimately, Jesus, when he came, Scripture prophesied in the Old Testament, he was going to reign on the throne of his father, David. He was going to be uh, the son of David, a Yeshua ben David, the son of David. David was the greatest king in all of Israel's history. And that is why, as it said in the Old Testament, that Jesus would reign on his throne. In other words, like King David. In fact, this, this kind of language concerning Christ being anointed in this manner is all across the scriptures. One such place is, is in Isaiah chapter 11. You don't have to turn there, but listen to what Isaiah writes. Verse, 11, verse 1, he says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of Yahweh will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. This is, this is language that is descriptive of a king. This text is talking about he's going to reign. There's going to be a king coming. And what does it say in verse 2? The Spirit of God is going to rest upon him. So when the Holy Spirit came in Jesus' baptism and it says descended upon him, that was, that was symbolic. He's anointed as the King of Israel. He is going to reign as the Lord of glory. But not just the King of Israel. He's the King of the kingdom of God. This kingdom that's not of this world. In fact, as I said earlier, Jesus' name in, in, um, in Greek is Christos, and that's derived from Hebrew, which is Mashiach, and that means anointed one. In fact, uh, oftentimes when we, we talk about Messiah, which is taken directly from Hebrew, but Mashiach, that word is used to describe David and, and the kings in Israel, because it's, simply, it's a generic term, it just means anointed one. It, you could say that in, in, in Hebrew it would be a lowercase Mashiach, it's just generic, but then referencing Christ in the uppercase Mashiach, the anointed one, not just a anointed king, not just a anointed man, but the anointed king. Elsewhere in Isaiah, Isaiah had a lot to say about this. In Isaiah 61, listen to what it says. It says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. Interesting. That would be gospel. That word there, that would be translated gospel. Hey, Christ, uh, this is a messianic prophecy here. Christ is going to be anointed. He's going to come in, uh, in the power of the Spirit of God. He's going to be anointed by God to preach the gospel to the afflicted. How do we know this is messianic? Well, other than the fact that it's clearly by its language, Jesus himself uses this and applies it to himself. If you would turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. And in Luke's gospel, this would be, this is right after the baptism of Jesus and the, and the temptation of Jesus. So right at the beginning of his ministry, of his, of his public ministry, and verse 14 reads, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. Notice what it says there, in the power of the Spirit. He's been anointed. And then in verse 15, and they began teaching in all their synagogues, and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and, set, and to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Verse 20, he closed the book and gave it to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were following, falling from his lips. So Christ is anointed as Messiah, as the one who is set apart by God to save the people of God from their sins. Of great significance is the baptism of our Lord Jesus, both in terms of his, his fulfilling the law and even a symbol. After, right after the baptism, I should say, a symbol that he is anointed by God. And ultimately, even this plays into, the, uh, referencing the Spirit's work, this plays into what is called the covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption. That before the foundation of the world, when the Father sets aside the elect to save them, and Christ agrees to die for the elect, to save them from their sins. We've talked about the covenant of redemption before. We forget also, sometimes we forget to mention that the Holy Spirit joins in as well. And before the earth is created, the Spirit agrees to come in to, to space and time to enable the Lord Jesus Christ to do what He would come to do on earth and then to regenerate the people of God. So the covenant of redemption has the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all working. It's a Trinitarian salvation. The Father chooses, the Son dies, the Spirit applies. Trinitarian salvation. And so here, the Holy Spirit is fulfilling His role in the covenant of redemption. The Holy Spirit is fulfilling His role. He's going to enable Christ to do what He did. And that, that speaks to even how, how can we live out this Christian life, brother? Even to bring some application into this. How can we do the things God has called us to do? How can we be men and women of prayer? How can we be evangelistic? It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is by the Spirit of God enabling us by His strength. We must rely on the strength and the power of the Spirit of God which He supplies to us if we're to get anything done as believers. If we're to serve God, it's an imperative. How do we know this? Even Jesus Himself relied on the Spirit of God. In His humanity. In His humanity, He relied on the Spirit of God for strength. And He did all that He needed to do perfectly. And in verse 12, we've seen two members of the Trinity, the Son and the Spirit. And then we see the Father introduced. Excuse me, I'm sorry, not verse 12, verse 11. It says, and a voice out of the heavens. Excuse me, and a voice came out of the heavens. Listen to what it says. And this is the Father speaking. It's, he says, you are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. This is one of the rare instances in all of Scripture where the Father speaks audibly. Audibly from heaven. Where the voice of God is actually audibly heard. I, you, you just think about, man, standing there on the banks of the Jordan and seeing John, who was the best, the, the, the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. And then we see Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. And then we see the Spirit descending. And then, then you, after that, you see the heavens are, are, are being torn open. And there's a voice coming out of heaven. I would probably collapse out of shock. But this is, this is a rare event. A unique event. And even this is one of the rare times where all three of the members of the Trinity appear and are working right at the same moment. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved son. Just want to say this though in reference concerning the members of the Trinity. It's interesting the correlation between Jesus' baptism and even our baptism as believers. When, when someone believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we especially as Baptists, we know they are to be baptized. They're to be immersed as a, as a, as a symbol that they died to sin and they've been raised to walk into some life. And, and what are we to do? We're to do it in the, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, uh, just one chapter back in Matthew 28, that's exactly what Jesus says. 
Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we're to invoke each of the members of the Trinity when baptism occurs. And interestingly enough, in Jesus' baptism, all three of the members of the Trinity are there in that scene. So there's an interesting correlation there and interesting similarities between those two that we find. But it says, nonetheless, the quote reads, You are my beloved Son. Or you can also read it, My Son, the Beloved. That would be that the Father has a love for the Son. A great love. This is what theologians call intra-Trinitarian love. Not inter, intra. Inter would be that it's in between them, but it goes out. Intra is, it stays between the members of the Trinity. There is a specific love that the Father and the Son and the Spirit have for one another. And it is, is for the members of the Trinity. In fact, if we think about, you know, what were the, what were the members of the Trinity doing in the eternity past. The scripture doesn't speak too much as to what they're doing. You know that the covenant of works was enacted. But there was a, I know that there was an eternal love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus speaks to this, this great love. It's honestly one of the most enriching things to study as a believer. The love between the Father and the Son, and even the Son and the Spirit, and the Spirit and the Father. Um, in John 3.35, but this is John, John the Baptist, his last testimony. He says, the Father, this is right before uh, the last verse of chapter 3, which ends John's quote. One of the closing things he says concerning Jesus in verse 35, he says, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Brethren, this is, this is what's amazing. Do, we, do you realize that we are a gift from the Father to the Son, <coughs> the Son to the Father? Do you realize that? What, what is it? So we're ordained, uh, as Ephesians 1 tells us, the Father from the foundation of the world sets us apart for salvation. It, it predestines us to eternal life through Jesus Christ. Gives us to the Son. The Son redeems us and, and saves us. And then the Son presents us unto the Father as His children. We're a gift of love between the members of the Trinity. In John 5 as well, Jesus referenced Jesus here speaking in, in verse 20. He says, For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself is doing. And the Father will show Him greater works than these so that you will marvel. The love between those and the Trinity is a great love. A great love. That's one of the reasons Christ came. Why did Christ come out and do what He did? He loved us. He wanted to bring His name glory. Absolutely, those reasons. But also, He loved the Father. He wanted to please the Father. For those of you who are married, I'm sure that you can remember, and hopefully you still even now have this within you, that you love your spouse so greatly that whatever they, whatever they ask of you, as long as it's, of course, not sinful, you will joyfully do because of your love for them, because of your adulation for that person. So it is in the members of the Trinity. There's a great love that exists. And so when the Father sets us apart for eternal salvation, the Son willingly, joyfully comes and dies for us. And then when we speak about inter-Trinitarian love, which would be love that's between the members of the Trinity and goes out to us, that's where we become recipients of that. We become the, the objects of that great love as well. We're included in that. All by the grace of God. And so he then says, in you I am well pleased. It's interesting, the Greek word here, eudikeo, is an abs is just a it's a, an excellent translation. I'm reading out of the New American Standard, and it says, well pleased. And eudikeo is a Greek word, it's taken from two different Greek words, eu and dukeo, which dukeo means seen, or sometimes it's translated um, uh, please, and then you as well. And so literally put together, it's well pleased, or to be pleased with something. And so here, even, even in English, we have that similar uh, contraction, those two words put together like that, well pleased. So it's a very good direct translation of what the original author was writing. 
The Father was pleased in the obedience and the perfection of the Son. That's what's so glorious, brethren. We think that righteousness is given to me. I, when I believe on Christ, I'm wrapped in that righteousness. And so the Father sees me and He says over me, I'm well pleased in you. And it's not because of me. It's in spite of me. He sees me wrapped in Christ's righteousness. And so He's pleased in me. If that does not provide you assurance, nothing can. But it, it nonetheless, for the child of God, it does provide great assurance. It provides the greatest assurance of salvation that one can attain to, considering the sufficiency of the work of Jesus Christ. Now in these moments, as we bring things closer to a close, I do want to consider the second thing, and that is Jesus' ministry being marked by fasting, or marked by his, his temptation in the wilderness. And that would be verses 12 and 13. And so again, we find that word that Mark likes so very much to use. Immediately, he says, the spirit impelled. Interestingly, our English word impelled is taken from the Latin word impellare. And the Latin word impellare actually means to push. So the spirit here is urging and pushing Christ. Not that he's unwilling, but there's just such a great urgency. There's a great necessity for this. But the Spirit compels Christ to, what does it say? To go out into the wilderness. This would be the wilderness of Judea. And uh, this land was, uh, was very desolate. No trees, hardly any grass, and a bunch of ravines. It's a very desolate area. And we know also that that's where John... Uh, conducted much of his ministry, and where he was for most of uh, his time serving God, and he was out there in the wilderness, alone unto God, and uh, totally in a, in, a, in a solemn place, really a place of, of solemn worship before God, just a quiet place where he can draw near to God. And Jesus goes out there by the power of the Holy Spirit, verse 13, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And I was, I was very curious when I read this, Concerning 40 days, because we're all probably familiar with some of the instances in which a 40-day period is mentioned in Scripture. And I was wondering, what is this biblical significance? And there does not seem to be a necess necessarily a consistent uh, significance to the number 40, other than it's just used commonly in Scripture. Uh, we know that it rained 40 days and 40 nights during the flood, or uh, as the flood was happening. We know that Moses, when he went up on Mount Sinai... After receiving the Ten Commandments, he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights, did not eat or drink. Uh, we know also Moses did that actually twice. This is, I, didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know that either until I studied that. That Moses was up, uh, with, uh, had one of these experiences, these 40 day, 40 night fasts, twice. The second time was interceding on behalf of the Israelites in, in Deuteronomy. We know also that, uh, that Elijah, uh, in his ministry, he had one of these 40 day and 40 night fasts. Uh, experiences where he was out in the wilderness as well, actually going to the mountain of God. And so Jesus really, I, I, you could say, Jesus is a, is a you, and this probably wouldn't be too far of a stretch, Jesus is a, uh, those things were type and shadow of what Jesus is coming to do. And Jesus is ultimately the greater fulfillment of those things. But that's not necessarily inferred in the text, so I wouldn't go that far necessarily. And it says he was being tempted by Satan. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the adversary. And this was necessary. Why? Again, he had to fulfill righteousness. He had to be tempted to sin. Greatly. As we are. We are greatly tempted to sin oftentimes in what we do. We succumb. We fall. But Christ, our elder brother, our head, our Savior, our God, our King comes in and, and instead of, of falling as we do, he bears the weight of temptation, the weight of sin upon his shoulders, and he resists. He resists. And it says even that he was with the wild beasts. That would mean the reason that's put in here is to just accentuate and to further stress the fact that he is out there and nobody's near him. He's out there with just wild animals. It's just him and Satan tempting him. And of course the Spirit of God with him. And one more party of people. That would be the angels. It says the angels were ministering to him. And it uses that, that present continual sense of the word there. That it's something that's constantly happening. That the angels were ministering to him. They were helping him in this time of trial and tribulation. It was great difficulty that Jesus underwent. 
And Matthew 4 highlights a lot of, of, of what happened when, this, when Satan tempted him. But suffice it to say, what Jesus did was he yielded not to the temptations of Satan. In fact, he took the sword of the Spirit. He used it. He used the Word of God as his defense. Every time Satan attacked him, tempted him, he would reply back with Scripture. And he resisted. And that's a, that's a great model for how we are to resist sin. Let's, let's stand upon the authority of the Word of God. The angels are ministering to him. It's interesting, Psalm 91 says that God will give his angels charge concerning the righteous. And it uses a term there in Psalm 91, it says that your foot does not strike against a stone. So brethren, the, the promise here in the Old Testament is a sense in which God gives charge to his angels concerning the righteous to guard them. And ultimately that is fulfilled in Christ here as he is being tempted by Satan. And the angels <coughs> are ministering to him. And ultimately what does he do? He resists. He's triumphant. And he goes and continues on in his ministry. And as we know from the, uh, the New Testament record, that he made a public display of the work of Satan. In other words, he made Satan look like a fool. He destroyed the works of Satan. Restored what the enemy stole. Union with God. All the way back in the garden, the serpent was there tempting man and woman. And they fell. And Christ comes, just as God promised there in Genesis 3, to crush the head of the serpent. And he does that very thing. And so really, these two events mark Jesus' ministry, the beginning of it. And other events, as we, as we consider a couple other of those events, and even maybe these two in further detail and a couple of other gospel writers and their accounts, <laughs> It's really glorious to consider that this was marked in God's sovereignty. He, or, he ordained these events to come about to mark this significant, this significant event. And I look forward to looking at next week, Lord willing, what verse 14 and verse 15 say. Because that is where Jesus' preaching ministry begins. And we'll see what Jesus was preaching when he began. Brethren, I exhort you, please, to be men and women who heed the word of God. To be obedient to the Word of God and to follow after the example of our blessed Lord, but also to rest in His perfect performance that was accomplished on our behalf, and to rest in His imputed righteousness, gift righteousness, you could say, a free gift of God's grace. And I implore you, you who are lost, to flee to the Savior, to flee to Christ today, and to be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ, to be justified on the merits of Christ. And you too will be anointed by the Holy Spirit. You'll have the anointing from God on high. And the Spirit of God will regenerate you and recreate you. You'll be born from above. And so we've seen here in these few verses that Jesus' ministry was, the beginning was marked by baptism. It was marked by fasting or temptation in the wilderness. God is, in His essence, perfect and holy. And in His holiness, He's given His law. And as I said earlier, we've broken that. We've, we've trampled His commands on the foot. And we deserve hell for our sin because we've lied and stolen, dishonored our parents, things Christ certainly did not do. And we are condemned to hell, but God in His grace and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to fulfill the law on behalf of the people of God and to die as a sacrifice for sin. And he raised on the third day. He satisfied the wrath of the Father and fulfilled all righteousness, as the scripture reads. And he's alive today. And so for the sinner, the sinner must come and believe. To flee their sin. They must, they're bid, they're, they're bidden to, to flee their iniquity, to flee their transgression, to believe upon Christ, and they'll be forgiven of their sin and given the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ as a gift wrapped in his righteousness. He takes my sin and gives righteousness. And this is for the Christian as well. Oh, this is our daily bread. Manna from heaven. 
by the grace of God and for the glory of God and for the glory of the triune God. All scripture is theocentric. Theocentric. It's all about the triune God and how he is working to bring about the salvation of the people of God. So to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, be glory and honor and praise forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I am so weak and so, so sinful, Lord. And I confess my sin before you. I confess my law breaking. But how I thank you, Father, for the righteousness of your Son that has given as a gift of grace to me. I thank you that the Spirit of God has given me grace to believe, to believe something I otherwise would not have done. Thank you, Father, that you have adopted me and all of your saints who have been saved up until now. You've adopted us as sons and as daughters through Christ your Son and for your glory. Father, I pray that as the Word of God has gone forth, that the people who have heard would now be changed by the Word of God. I pray, Father, that you would encourage your saints that we would grow in purity and holiness. And for the unconverted souls who have and perhaps will hear this, Lord, I pray on their behalf that you would show them mercy this day, that you would convert them by your saving grace. And ultimately, it is our prayer that you would be glorified in this church, in our lives, in all that we do. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this day. I thank you for the privilege to preach your word. I praise and I glorify you through Christ. I give you all glory and all honor. All praise for him. And to Christ be the glory indeed forever. Amen.